حلقة النقاش التالية بشأن أهمية البنية التحتية البشرية عند التعامل مع الصراعات وفي أعقاب الصراعات يتم نسيان البنية التحتية البشرية أو الاستخفاف بها من هم أصحاب المصلحة والمسؤولون عن إعادة بناء البنية التحتية البشرية وما هي خارطة الطريق المطلوبة لمعالجة هذه المسألة الهامة في المنطقة العربية للعقد القادم تشارك في استضافة الحلقة محطة MTV اللبنانية وتدير الجلسة السيدة منى صليبة مقدمة الأخبار والمحاورة في محطة MTV أدعو أيضا السيد بيتر مورر رئيس لجنة الصليب الأحمر الدولي وسعادة السفير رمزي عز الدين رمزي الدبلوماسي المصري ومساعد الأمين العام السابق للأمم المتحدة ونائب المبعوث الخاص لسوريا أيضا السيد جان كوبيس المنسق الخاص للأمم المتحدة في لبنان السيد روبرت فورد زميل أقدم بمعهد الشرق الأوسط في واشنطن والسيدة وفاء بن حسين مستشارة السياسة لدى أكسس ناو أهلا بكم ما شاء الله في منطقة الشرق الأوسط النزاعات لا تتوقف وبالتالي يجب علينا طرح العنوان كيفية التعاطي مع البنى التحتية البشرية مع الإنسان خلال النزاعات وبعد النزاعات طبعا أرحب بضيوفي الكرام أبدأ مع السيد مورر رئيس لجنة الصليب الأحمر الدولي سيد مورر أهلا بكم في هذه الجلسة طبعا للصليب الأحمر الدولي دور كبير لسيما أثناء النزاعات لناحية الحضور الدائم في النقاط الساخنة والمساعدة ولكن هل لنا أن نعرف بداية ماذا يعني Human Infrastructure البنى التحتية البشرية؟ Well, I think the, the meaning of human infrastructure has unfolded, uh, not least in this region over the last uh, 10 years. So if you go back to the basic idea of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent movement, uh, we were created to bring individual assistance and protection services to people disrupted by war and violence. What we have seen over the last 10 years in this region is that more than individual displacements and disruptions, we are dealing with systems, mm -hmm. with infrastructure systems which have been heavily impacted by war and violence. We see record numbers of people displaced and therefore the habitat systems of the region disrupted. We see water infrastructure heavily disrupted by war and conflict, and therefore water systems heavily disrupted. We have seen outrageous attacks on health facilities, and therefore health systems heavily disrupted, and therefore not only do we see the direct impact of war and violence on individuals, but people are dying because hospitals have been bombed, and. They are dying because of the secondary effect and the destruction of health systems and health infrastructure. And we have spoken about youth this morning. We have seen that the whole generation of kids didn't go to school. It's oh. not an individual issue. It's systems which have been heavily disrupted. And so I think the big task in this region in particular is that this is a region where Millions of people now are outside of infrastructural services, outside of social services, which normally public states and public service deliver to people. I'll ask you to this point later. Sayyid Ramzi, do you agree with the term or are there additions to the term what is the human infrastructure or human infrastructure? I want to thank you very much, Sayyid Raghda Dirgham, for the support. وعلى استضافة حكومة الإمارات لنا في هذا الاجتماع الهام لا أتفق تماما ولكن أكون أكثر تحديدا أعتقد أنها تشمل ثلاث مجالات البنية الإنسانية التحتية التعليم والصحة 
والغذاء بشكل واضح وللأسف فيما عدا الغذاء مجالات التعليم والصحة في معظم الدول العربية وبصفة خاصة في المناطق النزاع لا تحظى بالاهتمام الكافي وهذا ما يعقد المشكلة الآن وسبل حلها في المستقبل في قضية مهمة جدا لابد من التفرقة ما بين الدول التي في حالة نزاع وما بعد النزاع ولماذا؟ لأن المساعدات بصفة عامة هناك طيف من المساعدات تبدأ بالمساعدات الإنسانية ثم إعادة التأهيل ثم إعادة البناء ثم التنمية ليس هناك تعريف دقيق لكل منهما وهذا ما يصعب عملية إعادة بناء الدول التي تمر بأزمات وأعتقد هذه نقطة مهمة جدا حتى تتخطى هذه الدول المحنة التي هي فيها الآن وهذا قضية مطروحة ولكن لم تحسن بعد شكرا سعاده سفير السيد كوبس وانت في لبنان المنسق الخاص للامم المتحده في لبنان اي دور اصعب الدور الذي تلعبون في المناطق التي هي تحت النزاع او التي انتهت وخرجت من النزاع Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much, and uh, I, I would like to join uh, uh, by thanking uh, my friend Rageda for uh, inviting uh, all of us here, and uh, indeed our friends and partners from the United Arab Emirates for, for hosting us. Uh, and uh, uh, I learned a lot, I have to say, uh, and I'm still trying to understand how to respond the best, but I will respond by enlarging a little bit uh, the scope of our discussion. Because you asked questions uh, about the definition of uh, uh, human infrastructure, and I would, uh, and then there was the question about stages, uh, uh, conflict, post-conflict stage, and how to define that. And uh, here I would like to add a couple of points with regard to what we are dealing. We should not focus exclusively only on uh, 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 conflict and post-conflict, because basically, if you look at it, we need to be much more visionary. The whole discussion of yesterday and today was not only about 2020, it was about 2030, it was about 2040. And this is not about conflict and post-conflict, it's about human infrastructure that will fit the future. So we need to approach this when dealing with conflict and post-conflict situations, if at all possible, from this futuristic perspective. We do not want only to rebuild the old. We, if at all possible, not always that is possible, we need to focus on building for the future. Building for the future, it means that it most likely should be not a replica of old, but taking into account also the interest of, again, constituencies for which we are trying to rebuild this. Not only those that are affected by the conflicts, vulnerable people internally displaced or, or refugees very often returning back, uh, but uh, also the young generation, women. Then immediately you have the scope. It's not only the physical infrastructure that we need to focus on. We need to speak about justice now and for the future. We need to think about accountability. <coughs> We need to think about good governance. It was raised left and right yesterday. We need to add this element. And again, to be able to deal from this future perspective, uh, we need to be participatory. And I'm not sure that the approaches of the main stakeholders, and I believe that we'll come to this, uh, are reflecting uh, this participatory need to uh, engage, notably the future stakeholders, and not as just receiving the assistance, but as a partner and a stakeholder. So uh, I added a number of elements to this. It's not dealing only with, with the, the impact uh, and aftermath of conflict. And that's the last point. Yesterday, today, we heard as well about how reactive we are. We need to be more visionary. 
this region is mostly reactive in many situations, sometimes rather naturally, but it's also visionary. And don't take it that I try to flatter our host country. But if you look how they are building the human infrastructure from a much broader perspective, there are many aspects and elements of being visionary. If I'm not wrong, Dubai, as the first really smart city, if I'm not wrong, that should become a really smart city in 2022 or something like this, if I'm not wrong. This is amazing. Or ministry dealing with tolerance. Well, this is amazing. This is futuristic. This is not reactionary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Safir Ford, you were a member of the United States of in Syria. فلنتكلم عن المناطق مثل سوريا مثلا وهي منطقة نزاع هل فعلا كان في جهود لتأهيل البشر البنى التحتية البشرية في تلك المنطقة Thank you and thank you again for the invitation to be here today the conflict, the war in Syria has been so violent and so harsh and the scale of the humanitarian catastrophe so large that the international community has been responding mostly on an emergency basis. Uh, one half one half of Syria's population has had to leave their homes. And six million Syrians have had to leave Syria. The scale is unprecedented since World War II. And so under those circumstances, the international community's response has been above all just to provide shelter, food, and medicine for this vast number of people. If you add the six million Syrian refugees outside the country, and then approximately another six million internally displaced, uh, that figure, the 12 million, is so big that there has been little time and few resources uh, to plan for the kinds of deeper uh, projects to rebuild the human infrastructure in terms of the things that Ambassador Ramsey was talking about, education and stabilization leading to reconstruction. There just have not been the resources. The problem has been too big. سيدة وفاء ما الذي ينقص إضافة إلى تأمين الملجأ لهؤلاء كما تحدث السفير فورد ما الذي ينقص في دول نزاع عطينا أمثلة مثلا سوريا إضافة إلى الملجأ So uh, thank you first of all and congratulations to Ragida and the Beirut Institute for such an important lively and insightful conversation over the past two days um, I think when we talk about areas of conflict we often forget that these areas the sun rises the next day. People have to continue working, have to continue going to school, um, getting health care, etc. But <clears throat> the silver lining in being in a state of conflict or uh, being in a post-conflict zone is that you're able to build something new. Uh, you're, you're able to build something from scratch. And when I think of human infrastructure, I think really just investing in humans as, in people, as a primary driver of a new economy, of a, of a new type of reality. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> it's investing in knowledge economies, it's investing in technologies, it's investing in new types of education for individuals, reskilling uh, people in schools, um, it's coding, it's culture, um, and um, the roadmap, I think, moving forward for that, isn't, um, isn't only 
uh, incumbent on governments. It's uh, incumbent on civil society. It's incumbent on the private sector. Um, all of these stakeholders really have to work together to envision something new. And um, it, when we talk about a post-conflict zone and building a new state, it can't be a rinse and repeat of what we've already seen. It has to be something where we rethink our social contract, where we think uh, different modes of governance, where um, we, we rethink them taking into consideration the new technologies and the fourth industrial revolution that has in, in the meantime taken place. And I'm thinking about 2040, I'm not talking 2020. So um, all of these things lead me to be cautiously optimistic, also realizing that this region that we speak of is not at all monolithic. So the, the Levant countries are facing one thing like in Syria, like you asked, and the Maghreb is facing other types of issues. Uh, the Gulf has other issues, most notably climate change. I mean, these are all different types of conflict in different ways. And so we shouldn't really, our definition shouldn't be limited. Our definition should be uh, more encompassing and broad to, to allow for that type of visionary thinking. Safir Ramzi, بالأولوية من المسؤول أولا وثانيا وثالثا عن إعادة التأهيل لا شك أن الحكومات المعنية لها دور رئيسي في ذلك ولكن المجتمع الدولي ممثلا في هذه الحالة في الأمم المتحدة لديه مسؤولية أساسية بمعنى أن المساعدات يعني الإنسانية معروفة والتنمية مجالها معروف أما موضوع إعادة التأهيل فهناك خلاف عليه ونستطيع نتحدث بالنسبة لسوريا الموقف الآن وهذا السفير صديق السفير فورد ذكر الآن وفي جلسة صباحية أن هناك عوائق أمام تمويل بعض النشاطات في دولة مثل سوريا في دولة كمثال نتيجة قوانين داخلية في الولايات المتحدة مثلا وهناك قوانين قوانين أخرى في في الاتحاد الأوروبي تمنع هذه الحكومات من تعدي موضوع المساعدات الإنسانية لدي سؤال إعادة بناء مدرسة تدخل في إعادة تدخل في مساعدات إنسانية بالتأكيد لا ولكنها كذلك ليس إعادة بناء ممكن تكون إعادة تأهيل حفر بير عشان الزراعة أين تقع في هذا المجال هذه مسؤولية المجتمع الدولي أنها تحدد هذا الأمر ما في شك من أتفق مع الصديقة وفاء المجتمع المدني له دور أساسي ولكن هنا تقع المسؤولية كذلك على الحكومات أن تسمح لل المجتمع المدني بأن يقوم بنشاطات كثيرة من خلال قوانين تسمح له القيام بهذا الدور سيد مورر من وجهة نظركم المسؤولية الأكبر تقع على الحكومات أو على المجتمع الدولي أو على المنظمات غير الحكومية well, I... I do believe that uh, this is such a big task that we can only imagine it if a multi-stakeholder effort is uh, looking at the task. I think it's of critical importance that uh, international and national, that state and non-state work in a different way together. I would join Jan Kubis when he says that we have to be visionary, but we have also to know where we start. And where we start is with a big discrepancy between needs and our ability to service those needs. Where we start is with a region which has a unique paradoxon of progress where one part of the region is healthy, wealthy, and well-connected, and the other part is marginalized, disenfranchised, and angry. And we look at a region which is the most disintegrated of all regions in the world. Meaning that compared to one, all other regions, there is the least contact within the region compared to actors outside the region. 
And if we don't tackle and start to tackle from these issues, we will continue to replicate those divisions in the future. So I do believe we have to link what we have discussed this morning in terms of new technologies and new opportunities to those realities with which we are confronted today in order to overcome them. And we have to link the responsibility question that you ask by working in a different way together. And we have to get out of the boxes. I clearly contest that it is useful. I mean, you, you asked the right question, Ramzi. The, 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 the big question today is which box fits what kind of activity? But it's a wrong question to ask. I think we have to put people at the center and look at problems. And then we have to see what are the instruments, what are the tools that we have in order to respond to those problems. We are still coming, each one, from either developmental peace, security, economic, technological challenges, and we throw those solutions at people. I think we have to take the other way around if we want to build the future. We have to look on where we are, what the needs are, how we address them, what the tools are, and then to define a strategy for the future. At the present moment, this region hasn't the infrastructure to deal with those issues because the, all the discussions are happening in an extremely fragmented way. And I think this region, if you want to respond to the huge challenges, needs the institutional infrastructure which allows us to deal with the issues, and I don't see it at the present moment. What I would like to add to this is, uh, and, and this is based on my previous experiences, now I'm uh, blessed to work in Lebanon and uh, not that the country is not uh, one of the most beautiful uh, on earth uh, and the people are uh, one of the most smart, smartest people, <laughs> very entrepreneurial, but the country is full of problems uh, and challenges as well and I might come to it. But before that I worked in Iraq for almost four years with the government, with the people before that for almost three years in Afghanistan with the government, post-conflict, conflict situations, etc. Uh, and when they were coming from different stages from their conflict uh, into a sort of post-conflict situation building, uh, what I witness usually that uh, the leaders relapsed back to their old way of thinking. Uh, and they thought that they can simply uh, do the business as usual. Because the emergency was not there, it was not very high, so they just applied their usual way how to deal. Uh, very much centralistic. Uh, very much, we will tell you what is good. And also we as the international community, we are excellent in providing recipes, analyzing situations, telling what is right, what is wrong, and then leaving it to, <laughs> to the countries, uh, uh, and sometimes to the people. Uh, so, uh, but if those that are perhaps the primary, primary agents that should uh, steer because they are elected or selected to uh, be the leaders, if they fail, to put the people in the center, and I agree with you, uh, to put the people in the center of, 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 of all of the efforts, they will fail. With all my love to, to our friends in Iraq, have a look what is happening in Iraq. They started well, uh, there was full of energy, uh, including uh, how to rebuild the country. The government came with a lot of good ideas and promises and international, reasonable international support, if you wish, reasonable international support. Not a Marshall Plan that they wanted to get, but instead of 80 billion, they received the pledges of 30 billion. My goodness, this is something. What happened? Three weeks ago, you had a massive demonstrations of people, not any kind of international conspiracy. Why? Because they came with a bill. So where, where is the benefit of this peace? Where are the changes? Where, are, where is our future? Young people, 
Where is our future? Where is dignity? Where is justice? Where are jobs? Quite of a sudden promises of 150,000 of jobs. But I saw it in the previous governments in the, that beautiful country as well. So I'm a little bit concerned that, that without changing the attitude, without really putting the people in the center in a real way, uh, we will have relapses. Doesn't matter that there will be always uh, uh, not enough resources, etc., etc. Uh, and uh, this is what is missing in most uh, of the countries, post-conflict countries, uh, or countries that should react to the challenges of the future, like the climate change. It's coming. Hadrat Safir for So, so, yeah. Yeah. So Jan was just talking about Iraq and the, the refugee challenge there, the, the challenge of displaced people. Syria, which is even bigger, uh, will be a challenge for the Mashraq for at least the next five, six, seven years, uh, this large number of Syrian refugees. So how to address a variety of needs? And Peter is right to say you have to put people at the center, but institutions that will address their needs, I think, are varied. Uh, they need things like education. That's almost certainly going to depend on the host governments where they are located. And I think here, uh, the example of countries like Turkey, which have opened schools to Syrian refugees is exceptionally important. It's been difficult for Syrian refugees in Turkey because they don't speak Turkish. Um, but the, the Turks have made steps to make it easier for Syrian refugees to access schools. Refugees, Syrian refugees also need employment. I mean, they, they don't have enough money to live in these countries forever. Both Turkey and Jordan have made important steps to open parts of their labor markets so that Syrian refugee families can work. But here is where, again, the international community has a big role to play. We need to be able to support governments like Jordan and Turkey when they provide essential services like education and health. They must be supported. Uh, think of the scale of the Syrian refugee population in a country like Lebanon or Jordan, particularly. So resources for those sectors, but also innovative ideas such as uh, trading partners of Turkey and Jordan opening their markets to companies that employ refugees so that a Jordanian company, perhaps established by a Syrian entrepreneur, but in Jordan, or a Syrian <coughs> entrepreneur in Turkey uh, who is employing Syrian refugees should be able to sell the products in foreign markets like the European Union. And so this is a sort of uh, trade agreement that again helps these countries manage this large surge in refugee population. تتحدث عن المساعدة الدولية لم تذكر لبنان كثيرا كوني لبناني لبنان استضاف عدد كبير من اللاجئين يقارب ثلث عدد السكان ويعاني ضائقة اقتصادية كبيرة أين مساعدة المجتمع الدولي هل يجب أن تكون للحكومة اللبنانية أو مباشرة للاجئين أو للمنظمات التي ترعى اللاجئين Uh, I think it depends on the particular needs that are identified. This goes back to what Peter and Jan were saying about focus on the individuals and how best to get the assistance to them. Although I think you always, 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 always must work in some kind of coordination with the host government. I mean, it, it should not be the job or the mission or the goal of international donors to always go around and subvert uh, the host country government. But the host country government may not be the most effective mechanism to deliver assistance. And with respect to Lebanon, I completely agree with you. And I think that it would be much more helpful for the United States to think less about military operations in Syria and to think much more about using that money to help refugee communities 
in places like Lebanon and Jordan particularly. Very briefly, because indeed at, 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 at this point of time I'm in Lebanon, so I'm sorry, I'd, I will stop talking, uh, but I would like to make one or two points on that. First of all, let's, uh, let's not forget about the context. Uh, when we speak, because the topic now is about how to deal with notably refugees, and I heard, yes, provide schools where they are, provide assistance where they are, etc. What is the context? The context is the Middle East, and the context is Palestinian refugees that for 70 years the international community is promising them, encouraging them, telling them, oh, you will come back home. This is what is guaranteed for 70 years. Uh, let's hope, I'm not as convinced, but let's hope. But that influences what is the attitude towards the Syrian refugees in, 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 in the receiving countries, in the host countries, and increasingly of the host communities, of the locals. And Lebanon with one third, plus minus, of the refugee population, notably the Syrians, but also Palestinians. As a prime example, you would not be able to bear the brunt each of these countries, including mine, of having one third of refugees for nine years, and the Palestinians in hundreds of thousands for 70 years. And with the example of the Palestinians, that maybe it's 70 more years. Mm. Or what? I don't know for them. So you cannot, and we as the international community, we should be very careful about just telling, okay, now take care of them where they are and maybe sometime in the future when the political considerations will not be applied anymore to the situation by many sides, not only one one side, then perhaps there will be time to return them. And in the meantime, create all the conditions. While I fully agree uh, with what was said about the importance of education, dignified life, some sort of future, and education for future life in their own countries. Thank you. Sayyida Wafa, if we want to talk about the path of the path, do we need to be the first work on the return of the people to their countries, or the return of the path of the path, or the return of the path of the path? I'm really glad you asked me this question, and I'm going to move the conversation a bit to the West in the Maghreb, and perhaps it's because I'm sitting all the way at the West of this panel. <laughs> um, so there, there are two things I wanted to say. First of all, um, if you look at Tunisia and the number of Libyan refugees that's accepted, and it's, it's accepted with wide arms, um, <clears throat> it's uh, somewhat surprising to not see as much support for, for that kind of uh, acceptance. Um, first, I, again, I go back to what I said at the beginning. The region really does have an opportunity here. And that opportunity is to, uh, to, to leverage the context in, in favor of building human infrastructure. Um, and also to take advantage of the strengths of the region. We have a, we have a population that is predominantly under 24, mostly tech savvy, um, generally well connected, generally, because there are definitely shutdowns in conflict zones. And I'm sure my, my colleague from the ICRC knows a lot about that. Um, but we need, to, we need to really work in, the, in this opportunity to ensure that the governance matches the potential. And this also goes to another point in that when you ask the question on migration, should we work on bringing refugees back to their countries or should we work to um, have better services for them in the countries they go to? I think it's, it's a combination of both. So if, if I look at Tunis um, and, and all the refugees that that country gets, from Libya and other African countries, a lot of the refugees there don't want to leave their countries. They're not. They're not like, oh hi, like I, you know, I have nothing to do today. I'll go to a different country. No, it's it's usually they don't have the infrastructure that supports them in a way that allows them to live a full life. And so, if we look at both the country where the refugees come from and the country they go to, it's it's absolutely crucial that international institutions fund and, and support new types of initiatives that really support non-institutional actors to involve them 
in the conversation, like startups, like civil society, and, and helping discover and, and structure new innovative ways to treat the problems they fled from. And uh, for Tunisia specifically, it's the only democracy in the region. And yet, it's, it, and it's struggling economically, it's struggling with refugees, and it's not really getting a lot of support besides support from the EU. Which, uh, by the way, I think the EU has been a missing component in uh, this conversation generally. So, I think we need to take a closer look uh, uh, at the reasons why people leave their countries and work on, on structuring those problems in a way that makes sense to leverage the, the strengths that the region already has. Amana, five minutes. So, daqiqa li kul shakhs, Sayyid Maur, hal min tawsiya ka raiz salib ahmar dawli fi hada al mawdu'a tahdeedan? I don't want to sound dramatic, but I think the region is confronted with a stark choice after 10 years of high impact warfare and violence. And the choice is for the next 10 or 20 years to grab international and national and local aid and to put band-aids on problems. Or to build serious infrastructure which will only be possible if there is a politically different dynamic in the region which will attract investment in people. So you can go down the road of having the next 70 years of a Palestinian problem multiplied by Iraqis, Syrians, Libyans and others. Or you can try to bring a different political dynamic which will attract investment and impact investment in infrastructure. And I would warmly recommend the second because for the first one the money will run out in a short time. Thank you, Safir Ramzi. بالنسبة لخريطة الطريق أعتقد أنها في تقديري لابد أن تشمل أربعة محطات أساسية أول محطة هي تعريف ما هو إعادة التأهيل بشكل واضح وهذه مسؤولية المجتمع الدولي ثاني خطوة هو بناء شراكات ما بين الحكومات ما بين الحكومة والجمعيات الأهلية الوطنية شراكات ما بين الجمعيات الأهلية الوطنية والدولية هذه أمور أساسي. ثم المحطة الثالثة هي إعطاء مساحة من خلال تشريعات للجمعيات الوطنية الأهلية الوطنية أن تمارس نشاط خاصة في مجالي التعليم والصحة وآخر محطة وهي تتعلق بالدول التي ما زالت في حالة صراع مثل سوريا مثلا ويكون هناك اتفاق دولي حول عملية سلمية وهو الواضح في سوريا أن يكون هناك ربط ما بين خطوات تتخذها الحكومة لي فيما يخص المجتمع المدني فيما يخص الحريات فيما يخص تطبيق قرار مجلس الأمن والمساعدات وهنا أعود مرة أخرى التعريف شيء أساسي وهام وإلا سوف يكون من الصعب التقدم من مرحلة المساعدات الإنسانية إلى إعادة التأهيل إلى إعادة البناء إلى التنمية هذا شيء أساسي سيد كوبيس كلمة أخيرة أرجو ألا تتخطى الدقيقة وستلاف تيمانات First of all, while addressing the immediate needs and there are plenty of them, let's be visionary because otherwise we will be always behind the curve and the needs of the future are already there now so whenever thinking about the immediate, if at all possible, not everywhere it is possible, focus on the center, on the people, on the young people, women. Let's not forget that the young people are so much connected that they can take decisions and will be taking decisions in their hands. That should also, uh, in a way, uh, format the uh, response and attitude of the governments, of the private sector, etc. So that, that's very important. But it's also another aspect there. People, where there are people, it's a decentralized, uh, very often, situation. So let's not forget it's not only about the central government, it's about communities, it's about the centralized system. Don't forget about justice, accountability, dignity, future job. And the fourth point, perhaps, uh, 
again, when speaking about centering on the people, education, education, not only for the current, but also for the future world, education is extremely important. Thank you. Safir Ford. Um, I would like to just say something briefly about one aspect of human infrastructure, and that is what to do about militias after conflicts conclude. And this is a problem in Iraq, it's a problem in Libya, still a problem in Libya, it will be a problem in Yemen, and it certainly will be a problem in Syria. And the, our experience in places like Libya and Iraq is not very good. I think a lot of us that have worked on conflicts in this region need to learn from more successful experiences elsewhere in the world, whether that be in Africa or in Asia or in South America. Um, how to manage these young people that have been drafted or brought into militias, how to either integrate them into a national security force or to prepare them to work in other sectors. But we need to understand successful experiences elsewhere and what lessons we might apply to this region's conflict areas. Thank you. Um, I would like to echo my colleague, His Excellency Kubius, on a lot of what you said. I think if we are, once again, if we have the opportunity to build, we have to be as visionary and innovative as possible. Um, we need to integrate new ways of education. Um, this is a problem all over the world, not just in the region. So uh, draft, crafting communication curricula that makes sense uh, with, the, with the fourth industrial revolution. There are so many opportunities for us to take advantage of. And it's so important that we build properly from scratch the right way. If you, we're not afforded this opportunity all the time. But it's, it's important to do it right. And if, and, and, and if we want to invest in humans and if we want to invest in our populations, it's also crucial that we have fresh blood, that we don't have the same people leading these negotiations over and over and that we integrate different members of society, whether it's academia, civil society, or the private sector, in determining that future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sayyid Al-Fat. Shukran Leki Safir Ford. Thank you, Sayyid Kubis, uh, Safir Ramzi, Sayyid Maurer. Shukran Li'indimakum illa hadi al-halaqa. Shukran.